invite us to call on your name. You invite us to come close to you and God, to know the love, to know the hope of a family. God, we thank you so much for letting us have that opportunity today. And God, as Pastor Doug comes now and we continue to worship through the teaching of your Bible, we pray that you would use him, speak through him. God, give him the words to say. God, draw us close to you as only you can. Help each of us to receive exactly what you have for us today. Jesus, we love you so much. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. You guys can go ahead and grab a seat. Well, welcome to Fellowship of the Parks. This is the second week in our series called One Act. Now, what we're doing in this series is we're looking at five of the shortest books in the Bible. And so we began last week with the book of Philemon. This week, we're going to look at the book of Jude. Now, the great thing about a one-act play is, of course, if you have short attention spans like me, <laughs> then, you know, you can can ingest something. You get the whole thing maybe in one act. Now, as we look at these books, I'm going to encourage you to read them throughout the week because there's, there's a lot in them. They're short, they're bite-sized, but they are, they're very rich. So let me encourage you to do that. Um, we're, we're looking at the metaphor of acting, movies, plays, that sort of thing. And this week, we're going to talk about supporting role, supporting role. Now, I don't know if you enjoy movies and TV, but man, I do. I really enjoy them. I'll binge watch things, and there's those series that I can watch replay after replay. I can watch them daily. I can watch multiple episodes, one after another. One of my favorite series to watch is The Office. I like The Office. Oh, man, it makes me laugh. There's so many things there. It just entertains me. Now, my whole family, maybe not Kim, my wife, as much, but we, as our boys, we just love it. Well, you know, in that, there is a main actor. That, my, that actor is Michael, Steve Carell. But the supporting role, my favorite supporting role, I think out of anything, is... Dwight Schrute, played by Rain Wilson. As a matter of fact, Dwight Schrute is so funny. Uh, my son knows how much I enjoy him just watching him. And so for Father's Day last year, he got me a Schrute Farms t-shirt. Um, again, if you haven't seen The Office, uh, don't, don't mistreat yourself. <laughs> Watch it. it it's, some, it's some funny stuff. But see... He got, by the way, he was uh, nominated for Emmy Awards in 2007, 2008, and 2009 for his supporting role. But a supporting role, what, what that does is it adds to, it supports the one story and the main character. Well, in the Bible, that main character is Jesus. And the supporting role is the good news, the story is the good news of Jesus Christ. We commonly refer to it as the gospel. And that is, just simply put, it is the testimony of Jesus Christ being the Son of God, the Son of God who was fully human, tempted in every way, never sinned, but he willingly went to the cross as a payment for our sin and is the testimony of the resurrection of Jesus. And that gospel, it frees us. It gives us life. It can transform eternally. Now, the book of Jude, the book of Jude, we see Jude as, he's, he's really in a, a supporting role. His goal is to elevate Jesus Christ. It's to elevate the gospel. And by the way, Jude, 
his name actually is Judas, but he was given Jude. That's what it shortened to so as not to confuse him with Judas Iscariot. Now, I'll just want to tell you, if you were a Jewish reader, then you would understand a lot of the references in this book because it is historical. It refers to even some uh, extra biblical material, but his readers would have understood that. Let's begin. We're going to read verses 1 through 4. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. You see Jude's humility here right off the bat because James was a half-brother of Jesus. Jude was a half-brother of Jesus. But he's not, he's not putting the focus on that relational connection. What he's saying is, is I am a servant, I am a slave, I am, I am supporting Jesus Christ because he is the Son of God. Not just because he's my brother, but I serve him. By the way, when Jesus was alive, James nor Jude uh, actually believed. But now they're leaders in the church. He said, to those who have been called, who are loved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. So he's writing to believers. He's writing to those in the church. This is what he wants to write about. Verse 3, dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation that we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago, they've secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign and Lord. What James is, or Jude rather, is expressing is he would like to write about the common salvation that we share. As diverse as the church is, different background, what we as followers of Jesus, we are united in this common bond, this common salvation that is accessible to all people. And so this is what he wants to write about. This is what he wants to, to help them apply in their lives. But because of false teaching, because of these who have come in secretly, they slipped in and they've sowed a false gospel. They're false teachers. So what he writes about is he wants to contend for the faith. He wants us to contend for the faith and he wants to give warning to not be swayed by false teachers. Now, in this book, there's several examples that are given. And so you don't have the entire, entire text of Jude, that one chapter on your notes here, but I would encourage you. You can use your phones. There's an app there. Um, if you have version or Bible Gateway, you can bring up that app. Let me encourage you to look with me at the book of Jude. What, what he does is he gives this warning. He says, this is a reality. These things are happening in the church. False teachers are among you. You may not always be able to recognize them, but understand this. This is what they do, and these are some examples. Some of the examples of ungodliness, some of the examples and the surety of the coming judgment for them are given. In Jude, he gives the example of immorality uh, when... The people out of Egypt later dest were destroyed. God destroyed those who did not believe. It refers to the sin and the rebellion of the Jewish people that no longer trusted God but gave themselves over to false idols. He talks about Sodom and Gomorrah as an example and the surrounding towns that gave themselves up to lewdness or sexual immorality and perversion. These serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. He goes on to talk about them, about how they reject authority and how they, they reject and don't treat with respect as celestial beings. 
There's a lot to this. But here's the thing. The overarching theme here is that it's all about the good news of Jesus Christ. We as followers of Jesus, those of us together, brothers and sisters in the church, should focus on the truth and the gospel. And three things. First of all, the gospel is worth fighting for. The gospel is worth fighting for. That word um, that's used uh, to contend, to contend for the faith in verse 3, contend comes from a word that the word wrestle, it's the root of it. And so you are contending, you're wrestling, you're wrestling for victory, you're wrestling for truth. Now, it's not that this truth is new. It's not that it's made up. But you know how in a relationship, I'm sure you love your kids. You know, you love your spouse. Hopefully you do. And you know certain things to be true. But if you find value, then it's worth fighting for that relationship. The most valuable thing that we have is the good news of Jesus Christ. See, the gospel is something that God gave us, and it is the primary cause of the church. You know, there are great organizations that do a lot of things, and we partner with many of them. And you know, it's great when you volunteer your time, you serve, you give. It's great to see humanitarian efforts. But do you realize the distinguishing thing about the church is that we are the, the present embodiment of the gospel. God's spirit lives within us. The gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ saves, that he forgives us of our sin and gives us eternal life. It is the hope of the world. It's more than just temporary relief from difficult circumstances. It is eternal life. It is a relationship that is restored to the creator in which God is your father. We have to contend for the faith and we have to remind ourselves of the truth. Look, I think it's very important to read uh, the word of God, to read the Bible and to understand it as best as you can. As a matter of fact, you know, if you're not aware of the stories and some of the things that are alluded to in the book of Jude, let me encourage you, use a study Bible, go back, try to understand those. But the main thing is the main thing. Again, it's about the main, the main character, which is Jesus Christ, and what's important is the good news of Jesus. The gospel is worth fighting for, and the gospel is also complete. It was complete once for all. For one, it was entrusted to, to, to us. It was entrusted to the church. It is unchanging. You know, the Bible tells us that in the, the very last part of the book of the Revelation, that we are to take away nothing from God's Word, and we're not to add anything to it. But that's exactly what was happening. What you see here and what's explained in this passage is that this, this, this battle, if you will, is, is for the truth, and there is a, a battle that we are to participate in, and more of in a defensive posture to protect ourselves, to protect our own faith. And we don't always recognize them. But in verse 4, it says, certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. Well, that means that false teachers are often, they're disguised as friends. They're disguised, they look on the outside like they're the real deal, but the truth is, is they're not. They've crept in unaware. And what they do and the way you, you notice them is they redefine Jesus and they redefine morality. And they take and they make the good news of Jesus Christ something that it's not. They don't add to it. Uh, we don't add to it. They shouldn't add to it, but they do. They become legalists, they become controlling, and they become manipulative. What we see in verse 11, and I just want to read this to you. 
it says this. The examples are given, and in verse 11 it says, Woe to them, they have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error, and they have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. Now, those are three things that, again, are described and talked about in the Old Testament. But the bottom line is, he's basically saying false teachers are those that approach God on their own terms. In other words, they make God who they want God to be to fit their needs. They not only approach God on their own terms instead of for who he is and who the Bible says he is, but they also engage, they use God for their own gain. And we see this happen all the time. And the ones that, that are true, look, they reject God's chosen leaders. And so when you see people that are, are like you, they're you know, in and amongst us, there are false teachers out there. The Bible tells us and warns us that that is an ever-present reality. What we must do is sort of distinguish and, again, wrestle for our faith. Wrestle and remind yourself of the truth. You know, for me, it's, it's hard to really process on a human level the grace of God. I mean, think about it. The Bible tells us that all of our sins, past, present, and future, if we trust our lives, if we believe in Jesus Christ, if we follow him, then we're forgiven. And those sins will no longer stand to condemn us. You know, there's many days that I wake up, I know I've made a commitment to Christ. Uh, there are times where we go through struggles and circumstances are difficult. And I just don't feel saved that day. You know, I think about my own guilt and how could anybody really ever forgive all the things that I've done wrong? Well, not just anybody can, but God can. And he does. And what I have to do is remind myself by reading Scripture is to just camp on the fact that the, what the Bible says is true. If we confess our sins that Jesus is just, he cleanses us from all of our sin. He throws our sin into the sea as, as deep as possible. He casts it from himself as there is east to the west. These are the things that we must wrestle with, remind ourselves, and fight for in the context of communicating it to others. Because the church is the cause. The gospel is the cause. We as the church, we em embody that. We, our mission is to go out and to help others know the same grace, love, and forgiveness that we know. That's incredibly valuable. We must fight for it. The second thing I want you to notice is when contending for the gospel, don't fight for the wrong things. Don't fight for the wrong things. Because it's very easy for people to confuse the gospel with a couple things. First of all, their preference. You know, people love different traditions and so forth, and I get that. You know, they're things that you grew up with. These traditions are something maybe you learned at the church, and, you know, it's easy sometimes to focus on what we're not doing that you prefer that you wish we would do. It's easy for people to, to just argue and disagree about things that, honestly, are pretty meaningless. People have different traditions, and they let this be a dividing issue in the church. Uh, they have preferences, of course, maybe for different preaching or teaching styles. But what they convince themselves is that their prefer preference is the only right way. That's the way it must be done. Uh, that's the way they did it in the early church. You know, there's all kinds of arguments. But you know, music in the church your style of music is a preference. You realize there are no such, there's no such thing as really Christian music. There are Christian lyrics. But, you know, notes, music is music. It's a vehicle. What makes it Christian is, is the lyric and what it communicates. Does it communicate and allude to the gospel? Does it speak of Jesus? 
But see, we get so caught up and we get so distracted on, you know, our style. We like this, we like traditional, this, wish we would do this song, wish we'd do that song. And we get so like torqued off. People, people leave churches. They, they won't have fellowship with other people. I mean, Gosh, the church seems like it's continually in some sort of subculture war with itself, you know, about what should be and what shouldn't. And I'm just saying, there are a lot of those things that are like that that are preferences. They're just preferences. You know, as a multi-site church, we utilize uh, video teaching in um, our campuses, uh, usually about 75% of the time. And, you know, there's a good reason for that. The good reason is so that the campus pastor can focus on connections and relationships. I, I can give you an entire list. But whether you have a live teacher or a video teacher, that really is not the issue. That just becomes your preference. Well, I understand. I have preferences. Do you realize that everything here at Fellowship of the Parks that we do, I don't necessarily like? It's not necessarily that I prefer them. It's just my way. No, because all of these things, the gospel is what is true. The good news of Jesus Christ is transcultural. But if we can, you know, do country music or rap or rock and roll or whatever to help reach and communicate the love of God, the gospel to people, why not? Why not? Don't obsess, don't focus on those things, and don't substitute that for the gospel. There are also there are secondary issues. We, in contending for the gospel, don't fight for the wrong things. One of those is personal preferences, but also the secondary issues. And these are secondary issues of, of theology, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, for example, what we use in our, um, in our starting point class is a statement by St. Augustine, an early church father, who said, in the essentials we have unity, in the non-essentials we have liberty, and in, in all things we show charity or love. And so, what really is the essential? It's that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. It is really that simple truth. It is the, the positive testimony to the resurrection of Jesus Christ and life transformation that occurs. When we go beyond that, and again, the Bible is filled. All of the, what, what the Bible is, is it really gives us just proof and testimony that, that God fulfilled his promise to us that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, the, the, the Savior. And we learn from his example and so forth. But listen, there's a lot of things in the Bible, I'll just be honest with you. It's really not clear. There are a lot of things that are not crystal clear. So if we major on those minors, what we do is we, we create division. We create issues. Let me give you an example of something in the book of Jude. All right, in verse 9 of Jude, we have this interesting passage. Actually, let me start in verse 8. It says, In the very same way, on the strengths of their dreams, these ungodly people pollute their own bodies. It's talking about these false teachers. They reject authority and heap abuse on celestial beings. Now, look, I don't have time necessarily to give you a complete theology on angels and demons, but it gives us this example. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare to condemn him for slander, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Now, that is an obscure passage. There are different theories about what that means, what it pertains to, but the Bible itself does not tell us clearly. You know what? The thing is, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because the point, it is used as an example, but the point is this, that even Michael the archangel, 
Michael the archangel is not going to, under his own power, rebuke or abuse a celestial being, even Satan himself. But instead, his response is, the Lord rebuke you. And so the application for us is, look, we don't want to be guilty. We don't want to be guilty of slander. And for those who are, we believe, you know, under condemnation, we think they're wrong, we have to be very, very careful. The Lord's going to deal with it. I love the, the parable about the tares, the tares and the wheat. The tares look just like the wheat. They grow up together, and, you know, you can't really distinguish them. You can't distinguish the difference until you harvest. And what the Bible says is, is Jesus Christ will harvest. He, he will harvest in his appointed time, and he will separate the, where, the, the uh, tares from the wheat. So, again, these things that are not majors, I, I, mean, I could go on forever. I had a guy stop me not too long ago that uh, told me that he could, he could tell me based on a prophecy. By the way, he began with this. You know what? I have a gift. God's revealed to me what all prophecy means in the Bible. I'm like, really? And I'm thinking inside, oh, brother. Yes, and he begins to tell me who he thinks today is the great Babylonian whore from the book of the Revelation. You know what? I don't care. You don't know who that is. Again, the good news of the gospel, what we have, it is given to us, entrusted to us. We can talk about eschatology, end times. Look, I don't know how it's going to happen. Personally, I've shifted my position <laughs> multiple times in, in my study. But here's what I do know. Jesus is coming. All right? That's what matters. Not these other things that we stress and we focus on and divide bodies of believers over and, and you know, pit ourselves against someone else and write them off. Again, if it's a compromise, if, if it is a adding to or taking away from the gospel, look, let me, let, me, let me move forward. All right, here's the thing. Third thing, to those that are led astray, respond appropriately. Because again, this, this, is, this is Jude's writing, and under the, uh, the authority of God to communicate to the people, it's like, look, understand, you wrestle for your faith and know that what you've been told, what the gospel is, is true. Don't let anybody cause you to doubt that. And when people tell you otherwise, notice that there are others that are led astray. Well, how do you, how do you handle that? Look in verses 22 and 23 of Jude. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. Simply put, to those that are in doubt, be merciful. It's okay for people to have questions. It's okay for people to doubt the love of God, to doubt his existence. They struggle with that. I mean, even as a follower of Jesus, I'll just tell you, uh, I am so glad, I'm so glad to not be the person I used to be, you know, before Christ separated from him, dead in my sins. But I'm telling you, I'm so grateful to not be the new Christian that I once was, because I really had some things jacked up in my understanding. And I, I thought, man, you need to condemn sin, condemn people, and all of that. And I, I, I missed it. I had to learn. I had to grow. But it was cause that people were merciful, and they, they taught me. They helped me. It's, that's how I learned. That's how I understood. So be merciful. Don't let to politics and these other things come into play. A lot of times that, that is non-essential. But help those, be open, and try to, try to answer their question to the best of your ability. And if it's okay to say, I don't know. To those trapped in sin, provide help. Listen, we're all sinners. The church is, 
it's a hospital for broken people, and we all have our issues and our struggles. That's why I love Fellowship of the Parks. That's why we welcome everyone. That's why we don't have prerequisites for people to attend and come and even do some of our classes. And that's because, you know what? God loves all people. And God wants them to be in relationship with him through Jesus Christ. You know, I love that we have ministries like Celebrate Recovery. I love that we have groups that focus on different things, struggle with sin. We want to help those. And then finally, even to those in rebellion, to those in rebellion, mix mercy with fear. Mix mercy with fear. It is really about speaking the truth in love. You've got to be careful. You don't want to slander someone. You know, I've uh, taken to heart, because I used to not do this, but I had a pastor uh, challenge, just make a challenge in a conference. He said, look, never criticize another minister of the gospel. And so there are things that I disagree, and I'll tell you about the issues with, with, with you know, different theology and so forth that I disagree with, but I'm not going to criticize because I want to have a healthy fear. Again, if you go back in verse 9 and understand that, you know, what did Michael the archangel do? This is, well, the Lord rebuke you. In other words, God's going to handle this. God's going to judge you. He's going to determine who's right and who's wrong. But I'm going to tell you, based on my understanding of the gospel, which was once for all delivered or entrusted to the saints, the, the simple nature of the good news of Jesus Christ, that is what I'm going to tell you. If you make Jesus someone he's not, then in love I'm going to tell you. But the fear part, how does that work? Well, you, you should hate, you should hate the hurt of the consequences of false teachers and false belief. And that fear ought to motivate you to help others know the truth, the good news of Jesus Christ. And so, again, we follow Michael the archangel's example. Here's, here's the next step. This is what I want to encourage you to do. How can you contend for the gospel? How can you personally contend for the gospel? This week, contend for the gospel and respond to those who need hope. You know, I'm very blessed in that we've got a great staff here at Fellowship of the Parks. We have a married couple on staff, uh, Don and Julie Kawagashi. Um, I had the privilege of, of engaging in a relationship with Don and, and in time, you know, leading him to faith in, in Jesus Christ. He's a teaching pastor today. His wife has been really my only assistant, and she's great. I love her to death. But Don and Julie, they get it. They understand the gospel. They've, they've really built their lives around that. And so, about a year ago, Don's cousin, Cheryl, was diagnosed with cancer. Don was very concerned about her salvation. He wanted to make sure that she knew the gospel. And out of maybe fear of something happening to her, he wanted to be able to go and share, and he did that. Well, they talked about it. It was a long discussion. But, you know, he came back. He wished there were better results. But, you know, that's between her and the Lord. Well, they knew that she had gotten worse, and so they had planned to go, uh, to go out and see her, to fly out um, this weekend. But they got the phone call that she was in bad shape. She had been moved to hospice, and so they left Monday night, and they got there, and they were able to share. Don said he couldn't, you know, she could respond, but he talked to her. She could hear. And we just hope and we pray. But he did that out of love because he wanted his cousin to be eternally with Jesus, for her sins to be forgiven, for her to have new life, eternal life. I admire that. That is contending for the faith. Speaking the truth in love because you love people as God loves them. Would you bow your head with me? 
I first of all want to ask you that in these moments, it could be that you're not really certain to what the gospel really is and how you, you gain the assurance that you are a follower of Jesus. I'm going to ask you on your connection card, I'm just going to pray for you right now. God, I pray that you would give them the courage on their connection card, Lord, to, to just say, I want to know more about committing my life to Christ, to check a box. And God, I pray for all of us that you would help us to take that next step. Convict us of where we sin and where we, we focus on these preferences and secondary issues and make them the major thing. God, forgive us. Help us be more diligent about the good news of Christ. We thank you for the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, guys. Fellowship of the Parks, thank you so much for investing in my FOTP, The Next Step. You're making a big difference. In fact, I want you to hear more about the impact you're making. Hey guys, my name's Dusty Gallup. I'm the campus pastor of the North Fort Worth campus. Look, you guys are some of the most incredible when it comes to being passionate about Jesus and giving above and beyond to make a difference in your community. In this next phase of my FOTP, we're going to see an outdoor family recreational facility built right here on these grounds. So look, I want to say thank you so much for being passionate about Christ, giving above and beyond your tithe to invest and make a difference in your community. Hey, I'm Charles Thornton, the campus pastor here at Grapevine, and I'm standing right here in the middle of the construction that's going on at our campus right now. And it's something we had planned all along, which was to take out our back wall of our auditorium, expand and add about another 165 seats uh, to the seating of our auditorium. And we desperately need them. The first three weeks of this year, we were over 800 people and uh, our 9.30 and 11 o'clock service were absolutely packed. In addition, we're gonna be adding a second floor uh, to our kids' building and our students' building uh, that'll give us more opportunity to reach more students and kids. Hey, I know it's cliche to say we couldn't do it without you, but honestly, without you giving and serving, we couldn't do it without you. So from the Grapevine Campus, thank you for all you do to help us reach more people. Hey guys, Chuck Machika, campus pastor here in Hazlitt. Look, I am standing here in the middle of our brand new atrium. We have been in our building now for a few weeks and we are seeing God do amazing things. In fact, our adult attendance is up almost 40% over last year. Here's what that means. 40% more people are coming to FOTP and having an interaction that can change their life. And more people are having that interaction because you invested your time, your energy, and your resources into our My FOTP initiative. Listen, we want to thank you so much, and we are excited about what God is going to continue to do here at FOTP Hazlitt. Hey, I'm Troy Wolf, and I'm the campus pastor of our Justin Northlake campus, and I want to say thank you for giving to My FOTP. I'm standing on the property we've been able to purchase because you gave. Uh, this is going to be able to allow us to make a major impact in this community. We're already seeing our campus grow because of the purchase of this land. We have people coming because they see this billboard we put up here and they know that we're here for the long haul. And we're already seeing people's lives transformed and people's eternities changed. And so I want to say thank you so much once again for giving to my FOTP. It has been so exciting to see what God is doing in families. We're seeing so many people come with hope and healing in their families and having a lot of fun doing it. In fact, we just had a great date night and our classes are growing more every single year, not only within our church walls, but also out in the community. And here's what else is really cool, is we're seeing more families grow through foster and adoption. So thank you so much for your support of my FOTP. Isn't it exciting to see what God is doing because of your generosity? You know, my FOTP, the next step, it takes all of us. Thank you for those of you that have participated. If you want to know more about participating, let me encourage you. Talk to your campus pastor. You can also go to myfotp.com.
Thanks for watching. At the top of the page, you'll see a button for the connection card. Please take a few moments and fill that out. It's a great way to open up a line of communication with us. Fellowship of the Parks is a generous church. Your giving allows us to share the good news of Christ with others, including this online campus. If you would like to give, simply click the Give button above. You can visit FOTP.church to find a campus location with convenient service times near you. Thanks again for watching today, and we'll see you next time.